Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's devotional. Our thought today is going to come from Philippians chapter 4. Starting in verse 10, Paul starts describing how the brethren have taken care of him. Uh, they have begun again to be able to support him monetarily, materially, uh, in his work in teaching the gospel. He says, starting in verse 10, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, but now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Uh, there appears that for a time they supported Paul in his teaching the gospel in Philippi, or uh, the Philippians did, uh, where in Macedonia, and then at a certain point they were no longer able to continue that support, and now they've picked it back up again. Then he says in verse 11, Not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned whatever state I am to be content. I know how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Nevertheless, you have done well that you shared in my distress. As Paul writes, he addresses some of the principles behind the, behind the, the support that the brethren are sending him, that it's not so much about the actual material blessings that they're sending his way. He says, not that I speak in regard to need, not that he didn't need them. That's not what Paul's saying, but he says, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Now, Paul goes on to say he has learned how to suffer, how, to, how he's learned to uh, endure times where he abounded and to suffer need. There were times where Paul, even as an apostle, suffered times of need. And in the New Testament, when there are brethren who are considered in need, it's not like they need a new car or they need a new cell phone. These were needs of the basic necessities, needs of survival. And when Paul says, not that I speak in regard to need, it's not that he had never faced need or that God had never uh, allowed him to go through times of of uh, not having maybe everything that he needed if the enough food enough clothing and things like that but rather paul's attitude in those times that's what paul is emphasizing here and so he's thankful he rejoiced that they're able to send him again whether it was food clothing money in order to to buy food clothing things like that while he preached He's saying that it's not it's not that he didn't need it, but that in the end he had learned in whatever state he's in to be content. What different states had he been in? He had, he knew how to be abased and how to abound. Okay, abased is a lack of, abounding is having an overabundance of. Everywhere and in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. Well, how had, how had he learned? Notice he says, I have learned in whatever state I am. I have learned both to be full and hungry by going through them, by going through those situations. That's how he has learned. And in all of those situations, he taught himself to be content. And I think that there's a very important component here that reminds us that it is not necessarily human nature to be content. Content doesn't mean I'm simply satisfied and so there's a lack of ambition or a lack of getting a better job or a, a lack of desire for a pay raise or, or something like that, a promotion. It's contentment means I God has made me sufficient for today. That, that's what this term means. Contentment means sufficient. And what Paul's describing is that I've learned, and again, the idea of joy is to recognize that God has blessed me. Well, Paul has learned no matter whether he's full and he has no need for food or he is going hungry, maybe he's got all the necessities he needs to, to survive, or maybe he's enduring a period of time where he has very little and he suffers need that he is content, which carries with it the sense of joy that God has taken care of me and he will continue to take care of me. He's made me sufficient for today. Contentment doesn't think about tomorrow or next week or next year or at retirement or, or anything like that. It only considers the moment. God has made me sufficient 
for the moment. And that's enough. That's what that, that contentment, that restful state considers. This is enough. Okay. It, it doesn't mean that I don't have a wish list of things I wish I did have. Okay. But at the same time, I don't need them, first of all, to recognize God has blessed me, and I don't need them for me to have joy, that's the recognition of being blessed, and I don't need them for my, to, to feel like that God has, has taken care of me or makes it feel that, I, that God's not taking care of me. I am content. I trust in the Lord. He has made me sufficient, and that is enough. That's what that concept means. It also goes to show, just kind of as an aside, that a lot of people apply passages, things like Matthew 6, where Jesus says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. There are some who take that to mean that if you have the proper strength of faith, that you will never have a lack of food or clothing, because that's the context Jesus was talking about. Do not worry about what you will eat or what you will drink or what you will wear. Uh, God knows you have need of all these things. The Father knows you have need of all these things. What Jesus is saying there doesn't mean that we will always have everything we need. I mean, there are brethren, members of the Church of Christ in places like the Philippines who have gone through terrible hardships, flooding and, and things like that, and other places as well, where they've lost everything. And there was great need there. So I know that what Jesus is saying in Matthew 6 is not about, well, if you're suffering need, it's because you lack faith or you're not truly Christians. Paul, the apostle, suffered need at times. And again, these are basic necessities that are being defined as need, not, man, I could really use another TV or tablet. That's not a need. What Paul's describing is a state of mind, an attitude that recognizes God I'm going to trust him to make me sufficient. And even if that means that there are times that Paul did go through periods where things were lean, where there were times he maybe didn't have enough to eat, that was okay because he trusted God, he had made him sufficient, and that was enough for Paul. Then he says in verse 13, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Verse 13 is a very, it's a statement that is often applied in a very uh, blanket way. In other words, it's a, it's a very broadly applied passage. And there, there's nothing necessarily wrong with broadly applying scriptures when the principle supports it. And certainly, Paul, there's plenty of applications of the concept of taking strength from the Lord in times of trial and in times of crisis and times of sorrow and distress. Those are all supported principles in scripture. But I want you to consider the way in which Paul applies this passage. The way Paul is applying this statement is in the midst of these brethren in Philippi taking care of him, assisting him, and in the midst of Paul having learned to be content even in times of, of hardship. This is why he says, nevertheless, you've done well that you've shared in my distress. So now they're sending Paul this support. But Paul says, it's not that it's not needed or wanted. That's not what Paul's saying. What Paul's saying, he's basically taking this opportunity to teach and remind the brethren in Philippi that no matter what comes, no matter what hardship comes, and we end up suffering times of need and distress, we can be content through Christ. We can overcome those trials and have the correct attitude in the midst of them through Christ. Now, having said that, I want you to consider the actual statement that Paul says here. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Uh, the King James here says, I can do all things through Christ who strength or which strengtheneth me. Uh, there's another translation. I have strength for all things in Christ, the one who strengthens me. But it's interesting, this, this term here, I can do. This term actually means uh, I am enabled. I am, I am given the ability to prevail. Uh, and then this term all things literally just means all, over all. And then 
through Christ, means literally means in Christ, and I'll talk about that in a minute, who strengthens me. Another way in which this passage could be, in, could be uh, rendered in English, I am able to overcome all in Christ who has enabled me to overcome. That's the play on words that Paul is using. That's what's interesting about verse 13. Because the term here strengthens me, uh, that, that means to be enabled, to give, to be given strength. And so Paul says, I am enabled, I, I am able to overcome. I've been enabled by the Lord. I've been given strength. So I have the means to overcome all things in Christ who gives the, me the means to do it, <laughs> who enables me, who gives me strength. Uh, this term through is actually really interesting. Throughout the New Testament, there are three or four different terms that are used in different ways uh, that is translated sometimes through. But the two main ones that we find, in fact, they comprise uh, the vast majority of the times that the term through is translated. One is dia. It's where we get our English word diagonal from, going through. It literally means the channel of. In fact, most often that term is actually translated by. Uh, and for instance, the word of the Lord came to so-and-so by the prophet. Okay, God used the channel of the prophet to bring about his word. God used an angel through to speak to Cornelius, for instance, in, in the vision. And so by the angel, through the angel, God spoke to Cornelius. But it's interesting because this term E N is it's the the English spelling of the Greek term E N N. And it means in the state of, or the being, the, the state of being in. For instance, this term is often translated in places like times where people are referencing places like we were in Egypt or they were in the Jordan, literally in the place of, in the position of. And this is the term that Paul uses, which is interesting because the way we often use this is the dia method, the through, through the channel of Christ. But that's not how Paul's talking. That's not how, what Paul's saying. He's not saying that, that Christ takes care of these things for me necessarily. Uh, and it's not necessarily that Christ miraculously brings about some kind of, of change in me or peace in me that enables me to get through this. Instead, it's I'm in Christ. And it's because he is in Christ that he is able to overcome these things. So when he says, I can overcome all, I am in, I've been enabled to overcome all because I am in Christ, because he's faithful to the Lord. He has God's word, Christ's word, a part of him. Christ enables me. He strengthens me. How? Through his word. I don't believe verse 13 has anything to do with the miraculous gifts, has nothing to do with, with the, the application, miraculous application of the Holy Spirit or some uh, uh, power of the Lord, helping him through these, these times. Paul says, I have learned in whatever state I am. I have learned how to be both full and hungry. How? Well, we talked about it. He went through these, these, these periods of time where he dealt with these things. Right. But how did he learn how to go through them and be content? Because he was in Christ, because the word of God guided him, taught him, he learned it to be content because the word of God tells us to be joyful. Even in times we're not happy, happy is an emotion. Joy isn't dependent on emotion. It's dependent on objective perspective, which is that God has taken care of me. God has blessed me. And even though there may be things I wish I had, Maybe there are times I wish I had a better job or more money or different working hours or a better car, whatever the case may be. That's not the most important thing to me. I recognize God has always taken care of me and that no matter what state I'm in, no matter what hardship I go through, uh, 
I can trust in Jehovah and I can that and that'll be enough. He's made me sufficient and that's enough. And thus Paul says, I can do all things. I can be content no matter what comes through Christ who gives me the means to be content. That's how Paul is applying verse 13 of Philippians 4. Can you apply it to temptation? Sure. Because the same principle that Paul is applying to contentment in the midst of difficult times, hardship, lean times, can also be applied to temptation. God's word teaches us. We learn that whenever we're being tempted to fight that temptation, we've learned that when we're dealing with sorrow because of the loss of a loved one or grief of some kind, that we can be comforted through his word. This can be applied in many ways using the same principle that Paul uses. Paul applies it specifically to the situation of the material, the material uh, circumstances that he's facing. But it can be applied in a lot of different ways. We just have to remember, certainly not to take it out of context, as some people do, to make it say that they can literally do anything because Christ will let them do it. Whether that means that they think they can fly or as some people have taken it out of context, that means that they can, they have the authority to do anything because Christ has given them the authority to do anything. So whatever they want to do, however they want to worship God, Christ has given them the means to do it. That's not what Paul's talking about. And there are certainly ways to take verse 13 out of its context. And this is the beauty though of looking at context recognizing the principle that's being established and recognizing that that principle while certainly opening up in a broad way to other applications also limits how far you can apply a scripture because paul's not talking about enabling him to do stuff that he wants to do fly do whatever and it's okay or to worship god however he wants it's actually still bound by god's word this is what helped teach him to be content even in states of full and hungry abounding and suffering suffering need in let's see uh second corinthians that's the other passage i wanted to consider with you second corinthians chapter 12. this is kind of a, a an additional connection to what paul says here Second Corinthians chapter 12, Paul's uh, chapter 11 and chapter 12, Paul's dealing with these super so-called super apostles in Corinth. Uh, actually, he never addresses them specifically, he addresses the brethren uh, and warns them about these super apostles. But what Paul says here in, in verse seven, for instance, he talks about the thorn in the flesh he was given. And we don't know exactly what that was, whether it was the issue with his eyes that we know he had or something else. Paul says, lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations that he was given through the spirit by God, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. It was sent to, or, and God allowed it to come to him to keep him grounded so that he wouldn't get a big head. Apparently Paul needed that. God knew that Paul needed that. So verse eight, concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Just as an aside, notice Paul wasn't able to just heal himself. The power of the Holy Spirit, the miraculous works were intended for very specific purposes. The apostles didn't have the authority to simply use it willy nilly on whatever they wanted. Paul, having the power of an apostle through the Holy Spirit, did not have the authority and ability to simply heal himself. He prayed to the Lord that it be taken away. And then on the third time, the Lord said to him, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So Paul says, therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Now, I think this is a really unique uh, connection to Philippians 4 and the context of verse 13. Because 
this is part of the way in which Paul learned to be content. Notice it was the word of the Lord that in this particular situation, it wasn't not having necessarily needs. It was actually about a physical infirmity. But what Jesus says is, my grace is sufficient for you. And you remember we talked about being content. It's the Lord has made me sufficient. And it's almost as if Jesus is saying, you can be content and still have that thorn in the flesh. It's there for a reason. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Now, what Paul took from that is, when I am weak, then I am strong. It's when I have no power in myself and circumstances remind me that I have no power, no control. It's the circumstances in which th there's nothing I can do. I am in need or I am in distress. I'm in persecution. I'm in infirmity. And I realize I have no power. That's when the Lord wants me to rely on him. That's why Paul says, for when I am weak, when I have no power to change whatever I'm dealing with, infirmity, reproaches, needs, persecution, distresses, that's when I'm at my strongest because that's when I rely on God the most. Thus, when we go back to Philippians 4, verse 13, we kind of have this fuller appreciation for what Paul means. He says, not that I speak in regard to need, I've learned whatever state I am to recognize God has made me sufficient. That even when I'm going through times where I'm abased, I'm hungry, I'm suffering need, I'm relying on him and I can overcome because I'm in him. And in the Lord and in his word, I gain strength because I rely and trust in him. And I just think that that's a, it's a, it's a beautiful point that Paul, he doesn't have to say these things to the brethren Philippi. He could have just go, he could have just gone from verse 10, you surely cared. I know you cared about me. You just weren't able to support me on to verse 14. You've done well that you wish to share in my distress. But he stops to offer this point to help these brethren and in, by extension help us to remember that this life and the distresses, the griefs, the sorrows that can come from it don't have to define us. And in fact, while we may feel we have no power, indeed in Christ, we do. Maybe not over the physical circumstances, but over our own situation, our own heart and mind, our attitude, we do have control, even in the midst of the hardest times. We can overcome all things because we are in Christ. And when we rely on Christ, when we trust in him, we gain strength from him, from his word. And whether or not we end up never having all the things we could possibly want, maybe we continue to suffer need for a great period of time. In the end, we still recognize that God has made us sufficient. God has blessed us. Certainly there's physical blessings always we can thank God for, but most especially the spiritual ones, knowing that no matter what happens in this world, no matter what cares and infirmities and, and needs that we suffer, our spiritual state is overabounding with all the blessings we could possibly ask. Thus, God has made me sufficient, and that is enough. All I need is his word, and then the, that hope that his word gives me. That there's a home waiting for me, no matter what this world may hold. The home that he's prepared for me is so much more than I can possibly imagine. That's the devotional for you today. Lord willing, our next devotional will be uh, tomorrow. Uh, hopefully at 6.30. Hope to see you all then. Thank you, everybody.